Hey everybody, thank you for joining me tonight. It's uh, quarter to 11 on a Saturday night, but uh, why not go live anyway? And maybe some uh, people on Sunday after mass can enjoy it as well. Or even before. So basically, uh, yeah, there's lots to talk about. I have um, three or four stories that I want to get into, but there's been breaking news as well at the moment about something happening in Kulak. Uh, that's why I was late tonight. Uh, there's an emerging scandal to do with Antifa and the mainstream media and private security agencies and all sorts of filthy things happening um, around that. So uh, welcome everybody to the chat. Um, let me know if all is good sound and visual. No, never mind the visual. The sound in particular, because I know it was bad last time. Um, somebody mentioned that to me. Cool, sound is good. Yeah, I don't know why that is. I think it's because I had too many tabs open and I, I'm thinking the solution for watching videos is actually just to like all the videos I want to watch on Twitter and then go into the feed. And that puts less stress on my computer, internet, whatever it is. So yeah, um, yeah, I've been sick the last few days, like um, with a cold or flu or something. I'm still sick, but uh, so yeah, it's a funny day for me. A crackling sound, someone says, great, wonderful. So, okay. I wonder what that is. I mean, there's nothing I can really do about it. Someone says crackling sound, or someone else says it's all good. I don't know. Am I being trolled? Not sure. Um, but uh, I'll just keep an eye on the chat and look if it comes and goes. That's the best I can do for now. But um, yeah, uh, sick, like specifically today, kind of just getting gradually worse for days. And then today I was just like sort of full on man flu sitting on this couch and uh someone says stop moving around i can't i'm terrible at this watching a chat um yeah stop moving around i'm not going anywhere i'm sitting here you know but uh so it uh yeah i'm just buried in the chat here so yeah basically i uh, spend my whole day sitting around um feeling sorry for myself and doing effort posts on twitter and just being extremely online all day long goblin mode um, which is kind of good, actually. I, I kind of love doing that, and it's good to have an excuse to do it on a Saturday. Um, and plenty to follow. It, it kind of gets me thinking that with, with what's going on in Ireland, there's so much to cover that I could almost be like a, a Twitch streamer, or like Destiny or one of these people who just streams 24-7, uh, basically, or goes on for like 10 hours and just has like all the tabs open and just covers everything as it pops up. It's kind of like that because, um, yeah, it's hard to choose what to talk about because there's like 10 different things every day. Anyway, this most, well, I'll tell you what I'm going to talk about, hopefully, if I get time and if you want to stick around for it. I want to talk about Sean Meehan, who, the man who uh, is basically evicted, or not evicted, but ordered by the Tipperary County Council uh, I don't know all the finicky inner details of the planning and all of that, but essentially, he um, he has a like a a cabin he built around a mobile home on his property, and the council ordered him to take it down for not having planning permission, and he's refusing, and he's taken a political stand on it. There's lots more to it than this, which I kind of want to get into, I suppose, when I talk about it. Um, and it's just a very interesting case, a very inspiring case, and I was at the hearing for him recently and uh i got to speak to him i got to speak to others at that there were lo lots of people there that was good and i've sort of a report a reporting back on the vibe from that um then i might talk about if the internet holds up everything's okay this benga is his name benga even i don't know the african lad who was going around on uh, harassing people on tiktok this kind of harassment content and uh, he got quite a blowback online Mick O'Keefe and others basically posted it up you had Radio Genoa and all these big outrage accounts posting it and uh, there was this whole saga to do with that it's kind of interesting culture war flashpoint I suppose uh yeah I suppose really just watch some videos on that just see how it panned out because it's kind of it's not funny but it's entertaining it's also aggravating and there's there is substance to talk about with it too i suppose it's re it's not just outrage bait um it's relevant to uh, to broader ideas and um, then i put mcgurk at it again yeah i just want to talk about an article he wrote i have of course have this 
sort of um, long-standing sort of rivalry, I suppose, in a way. Uh, he's got a big publication and a big staff and all this kind of stuff. I'm not claiming to have parity or anything, but just in terms of the ideas, the ideas and the strategies and the different factions within what you could call the right, conservatism, populism and all that. I've, I've, I have a complex feelings about, you know, John McGurk's operation, his role within politics and all of that kind of stuff. And so I find it, if anything, I just find it interesting. And uh, it's a relevant conversation, central to the progress of what you would generally call the right in Ireland which is obviously rising um, as we speak every day. Um, it's a big question. The question, but Effectively, the question between McGurkism, if we can call it that broadly speaking, and whatever influences that, and uh, what's called uh, kind of the, the riffraff, the outsiders, the YouTubers, the so-called far right, the whatever, um, the grassroots nationalist scene, uh, the, the sort of, tension rivalry but also the mutual support that happens between those two entities um matters a lot and how that pans out and how that goes forward uh is very important and it's very nuanced how my my feelings on that are nuanced and the reality of it is very nuanced and it's uh it's something i always find interesting so when he drops a kind of i won't say a hit piece but when he drops a sort of a uh throws down a little bit on that matter it's it's worth talking about um by throwing down on that matter i mean generally speaking someone like him will be writing about the latest asylum center issue or ngos are taking too much money from the state and they're corrupt but every now and again he'll turn his turn his his vision back to the other sort of uh rivalry or opposition which is this this organic youtube nationalist right or whatever you call it um and so basically whenever that happens i like to kind of go through it and have a look at it and you know no big deal in a way but um that's it so lastly but also firstly is antifa being busted in kulak now i will say that uh actually before i say that by the way my link is in the description you can follow me on twitter and telegram I think some of you don't follow me on Twitter. I've noticed that. I've gotten more Twitter subscribers since I started doing these videos again, or followers. So if you don't follow me on those, you might as well already. I didn't realize there are some people who seem to only be on YouTube thus far. So follow me on the other things. You, you can Every day I post a lot, or a fair bit anyway, um, a new idea, new thought, whatever it is. I think it's worth following my Twitter. If I wasn't me, I would follow it. And uh, you can support the channel as well and support uh, the whatever the buy me a coffee links and all that if you want to as well. No pressure. Um, so, yeah, Kulak. So what's going on there? I can't um, I can't kind of go into it fully with you. I can't for two reasons. One is because it's very sensitive and perhaps I don't know about the law, the legalities around it. Uh, or the terms of service. I definitely couldn't talk about it on YouTube. But as to whether it's um, actually illegal or not, in terms of the, the kind of um, breaches of privacy or whatever, I don't know. Anyway, if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's um, Antifa basically went to Kulak today in some sort of very shady operation to document. I see, I need to give you the prelude, I'm sorry. On one end, it's sensitive to talk about because of the legalities and the terms of service and all. I, can't, I actually can't show you the videos. That's what it is, basically. Just a lot of videos exposing a certain thing. I can't show you, and so I'm left having to tell you. But that that brings up the second point, which is that it's just emerged, and there's a lot of leaks from a phone of corruption and all this kind of stuff. There was an RG bargy, and uh, I don't actually know fully what's going on there because it just happened or just emerged online in about the last hour um so again i'm just giving you what i can glean from a quick look which is that antifa speaking broadly antifa slash private security companies slash journalists who are basically in bed with the antifa more than journalists should be we're all in a, some sort of cozy little op and they went to kulak to it seems 
provoke people there. It doesn't look like an innocent puff piece that they were going to do, go up to Kulak and interview local protesters and get their thoughts on the 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 anti-asylum center protest which is happening there. I'm realizing all the background that some of you might not know, but I always just assume you're you're up to speed already. There's a massive asylum center being proposed for Kulak, and there's been a massive local resistance there against it and it's sort of a 24-hour protest going on blocking the entrance there's been a, some massive marches through the town with thousands of people huge and the thing about kulak as well i'm not a dub but from what i gather kulak is one of these kind of like fingless is one of these really tough areas uh, that has a lot of energy and they basically don't they're, they're not politically correct they're not afraid so it's a sort of a flashpoint in a way and what it seems like is this cohort of Antifa slash journalists slash shady security operators had were working on a piece, like a journalistic piece to go down there, but maybe part of it was to set up some sort of fight or fracas. Um, and what ended up happening anyway is that a uh, fight did break out. Some of the local lads maybe threw a few slaps to some of these Antifa. Again, a lot of it is unclear. And what ended up happening is that uh, one of the lads got one of the phones of either it's an antifa a journalist again come tomorrow morning people will have worked out via the footage that's going around which is fascinating what has happened it'll take time i expect when i wake up tomorrow it will have been clarified all the names and the shady stuff there will have been worked out so um it's really dodgy. I'm, I'm just telling you now because I can't do a full segment on it, but what I can do is tell you to keep your eyes open on it. Um, now, we know all this. We know Antifa. We have Rory McKiernan years ago with his uh, colleagues on Twitter and the hacking community. We have all these. We know full well that journalists, Antifa, tech companies, government officials, probably Gardy as well, are all pals, and they are all working against the likes of these local community protests conspiring in very 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 devious ways they probably share there's probably very little limit to the corruption that's going on with in regards to that we really don't know if you're uh like if you have a what, what's it called it's not just if you're on the dole but if you have any if your motor tax your any relationship you have with the state like your civil service documentation your pps and everything that comes with it, your file effectively um, plus everything you've ever done online, it wouldn't surprise me at all if there are direct contacts within the state and within tech companies and within the guards and within Antifa and within journalists are just completely sharing all that stuff around on key people, on key local people, all of that. Like we really have no insight into how deep the rabbit hole goes there in terms of that uh, incestuousness between all these supposedly independent industries, Antifa, which is like radical so-called anti-fascist activism plus journalists which is supposed to be like the fourth state independent honorable and all that the state which is obviously meant to be totally neutral and and above board and the guards who are meant to be um, unbiased and neutral keepers of the peace you know the intelligence files that the guardi are always hinting that they have on everyone and the sort of um that they're always waiting to make an arrest we're looking we're waiting for a crime to be committed so we can pounce on these uh, like you know you know the story with all that um so it's shady and i've always sort of fantasized in a way about what if i had god powers what if i had omnipotence like uh that i could sort of take every shady thing between the likes of uh one of these Aoife gallagher's mark malone's drew harris uh all the different journalists so-called uh leading politicians tech companies all that if i just had the 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 god camera to be able to just see it all skeleton key and get it all into a file and just it's you know because we know it's there and yet we just don't really have, ever have access to it so in this rare situation one of these lads got one like whether it's the antifa or the journalist or whether there's a difference even between those two things got the phone and basically they're going through the whole phone and they have another phone recording it so it's very meta and then you're watching it on your own phone um 
basically the contacts list of all these different people journalists from like uh, like very cozy call and text threads with, with these journalists with Sheikh Umar Al Dr Kadri or whatever he calls himself and um, it's mad it's basically mad and i think that's about as far as i can go with it in a way because um what more can i say i think that's all we know so far um just checking your chat um i think that's all we know so far but it's fascinating so um yeah i i'm, I'm just keeping an eye because it, it's unfolding as we speak so i'm just trying to get an idea if um if there's been anything new from you guys in the chat but i don't think there has been but yeah suffice it to say it's one of those rare um breaches in the code of silence and the the corruption among these people and it is just so shady there's there are screenshots where one of them are talking about bring your hoodies and your black caps or something like that basically antifa black block dress up and these people are going there they're going there with these i think bbc journalists and security firms to head down to this protest where there are women children ordinary people protesting something that is relevant to their local community peacefully i mean it didn't end up being peaceful but I think we know who the prov provocateurs there were. People are engaging in their democratic right to protest the most obscene of things, which is 500 odd or whatever it is. Algerian guys being brought in to be treat, like, treated like they're in a creche in the middle of your local community. A bunch of men in their 20s um, with nothing to do from very different cultures with different attitudes towards women and your daughters are walking around i mean it doesn't take a rocket scientist so like the, it's it's very tame to just protest that to just peacefully protest it and apparently that's not allowed either they're going to send down this um pr provocation operation um to 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 uh to try to bring the protest or the people into some sort of disrepute but i mean they got the phone now and they've seen the uh, inner workings of what this is so fascinating stuff um so about sean Meehan, i uh i just i was so pleased when i went to that hearing like i gave you the background just a while ago on Sh sean Meehan. i think i did anyway uh he he is being told he has to destroy his cabin effectively and uh if not go to jail and all of this but uh his hearing which it was kind of unclear what the premise of the hearing was i asked a couple of people outside because we weren't allowed in, but no one seemed to have a very clear take on it. It was basically a form of arrest, as from what I could gather, in the sense of like they had given him till a certain date to do that, to vacate it and destroy, take down the property. Um, and if you don't do that by that date, you're effectively going to jail. You're in breach of a court order, a legal order. Um, and I, from what I could gather, it was like instead of coming out there to just arrest you, as is what we've said is going to happen you're kind of going to go into court and there'll be a final sort of hearing on whether to enact that and he was told to bring a bag to bring a bag with him with his personal effects to go to jail effectively so it really was just almost like a formal we're going to rubber stamp you going to jail so bring your bag and um, that's as much as i kind of can glean about it but he um what ended up happening is he the case was adjourned again there doesn't seem to have been a clear reason for that maybe some piddling little detail they gave as an excuse but no real explanation of why that happened they adjourned it to the 6th of june instead now i had predicted that um 10 minutes before it happened i was outside talk, talking to some lads and I, I, I it was kind of obvious i suppose but i said to them i think with this big crowd here demonstrating outside the courthouse and they know there's such political pressure on them from the rest of the country if he goes, goes to jail he'll be a massive martyr i mean the country is not in the mood for that at all um, and he's such a perfect person to be in the center of this i'll get it in a second but um so it seemed to me obvious i was just looking around at the crowd the fervor the national mood thinking yeah the easiest thing for these guys to do would just be to adjourn it and adjourn it and adjourn it maybe wait until the steam comes out of it the pressure comes out of it politically wait till maybe people get bored they mightn't but they might as well so give 
I'm speaking from the state's point of view, give ourselves a chance here, see if it dies down, let's just kick it down the road, let's not do it now. So they adjourned it until June the 6th, so he can now go home, forget about it, allegedly. Um, and uh, and kind of that's that. Now, I don't think the heat will go out of this. We'll see what happens on June the 6th. Most people there I spoke to said, oh, no, we'll be back on June the 6th with more people. Um, and I don't think the the anger in, within the general Irish public will have gone away either by that point. So I don't know what it necessarily achieves. I suppose it just buys them time, kicks the can down the road. I have no doubt that if he didn't have that support, he would have been dragged off to jail anyway. Um, you know, because of course courts are not neutral. They're not. It's not Lady Justice. It's they're they are a political entity just like anything else. Um, but there's more to this kind of Sean Meehan story as well than, than meets the eye. Well, no, it's nothing weird, but there's sort of a, I, I just want to give you my reason for why I'm so inspired by this. I got to meet him. I'm not trying to put my reputation onto him, saddle him with any baggage I have or whatever. We're not best buddies. We didn't, uh, you know, uh, we don't know each other. I just spoke to him. He didn't even really know my name, but I, he spoke to a lot of people, you know. But um, I ended up getting to just generally chat to the guy. And again, I don't want to rehearse the conversation I had with him. Let's just say it's a private conversation, like any private conversation. But um, but it, the whole thing was interesting. In, I'll get back to him. But like I spoke to a lot of people, including Sean. And uh, you, you don't know what you're going to get at something like this because I've been to so many where everybody is really sheepish and they say, oh, it's nothing to do with immigration or... They're very wary of who you are. They say, where are you from? And you kind of go, oh, I'm from Cork, actually. Uh, and, uh, they, you know, they, it's weird, like, because it's like, you know, well, we're looking at, like, um, Ukrainians and Algerians and all these people, and now you're asking me where I'm from, like, you know, being wary. Because they either think you're a journalist and they're afraid of you because they think you're, like, a rat, regime rat, or they might have been drummed into this whole idea that you're so-called far right, in which case, oh, that's dangerous. Stay away from that. So there's this kind of aura around these things of neuroticism and paranoia and fear and you never know what you're going to get you might get a crowd who are totally sort of broken on that matter and uh that's not what i got down there at all i'll just talk you through like the experience so as as soon as i got there i kind of uh took a photo and went to tweet it out you know so i stood aside by myself and as i'm tweeting it there's these two lads next to me chatting away and so i asked them what's the crack actually with the court here tell me exactly what today is it all about so we start talking about it and as soon as we get past that the basics i say something to them like uh oh it's mad isn't it what's happening i keep it vague keep it real i say oh geez it's mad what's going on it's just uh shocking and uh one of them straight away these are two like just normal lads one of them says yeah it's mad what's going on yeah um there's uh you see like they're putting in accommodation and you know, and stuff like I've seen in Nace, you know, and he looks at me like, you know, like Nace and stuff like that. He doesn't know who I am. Um, so I, I just go, oh, yeah, like Nace and uh, and uh, Fermoy and, you know, Bally, Balhedrin. And I, I started listing them out and they're like this is sort of still a bit whatever. And I go, that's disgraceful. Like they're just filling the country with foreigners and, uh, and uh, giving them full bed and board uh, what, you know i basically do the spiel and they're like oh my, yeah okay so they were straight away trying to feel me out excuse me like i said i'm sick so like my eyes are like red and watery it probably looks like i've smoked something i'm just sick um so they uh yeah they were cool anyway so we chatted away i ended up talking also to a, a bunch of ladies from ross cray and this was great because if, if you're familiar with my this channel and my social media and stuff, you'll know I, I've had a, very, a big bee in my bonnet about what went on there as regards the Michael Lowry and Shane Lee and to an extent even Maddie McGrath, and these kind of people, less so Maddie McGrath, but the idea that they were sort of from this kind of top-down local political mafia cartel type of situation. They were sort of uh, railroaded into depoliticizing themselves and saying this is nothing to do with anything. It's nothing to do with asylum seekers. It's nothing to do with nationalist movement. It's nothing to do with immigration. It's nothing to do with anything outside Ross Gray. It's just about we don't have a hotel and services or whatever. And then the guards pushed them out of the way. So that was that done. And then what you're left is no political outcome, no political reaction. Your option is just 
loyally vote for Shane Lee the next time for councillor and Lowry once again for TD and their position is oh it's terrible what happened moving on um, which is such a waste because a town like Ross Cray, if it's going to be beaten up by the guards the least that should happen is a legitimate sincere arguably radical nationalist candidate sweeps up there and that's the government's Pyrrhic victory where they won because the guards came in and pushed people out of the way and to an extent what can you do about that but they left with a proverbial dagger in the kidney where they walked away in the long run they walk away limping and doomed because they yeah they got an extra few hundred migrants shoved into ross cray but what they did was they lost them politically ross cray went off the reservation and that's not what happened and uh, i spoke to some ross cray people in a protest in dublin and they were they were actually at the protest against immigration basically and even they were like sort of sort of a little lost like they were like no uh they're good guys and i said well th those guys said that it's got nothing to do with immigration and you know far right aren't welcome but ac according to your presence here you would be far right so i mean what's going on here like and they were just a little bit bewildered and i i, I just kind of felt like this is crazy like ross gray is almost like a model for exactly what you don't want to happen because we we we, we got past the idea of ngos infiltrating but what do you about do about local dug in old politicians who have this kind of company town loyalty of the electorate somehow and um, what if they are compromised and they are effectively working with the state to neuter and neutralize the uh, politicized backlash and protest against one of these plantation centers you're kind of getting nowhere for all the political capital and just gets pissed into the wind um i kind of left thinking ross cray is almost like an archetype you know and it's the archetype for that like we have to go back into the laboratory and figure out what do you do about that and I, anyway for the last few months I've, I've felt sort of a little bit slightly despondent about it thinking i mean how many people there get it some people must but i don't hear from them and what's up anyway i i end up meeting these like four or five women mams proper just mams from ross cray and they 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 do recognize me they actually had seen me talking about it and stuff like that and we went through the whole thing I, I said to one of them i said it's like you know it's like groundhog day or 50 first dates one of these movies where because basically what they told me to start with is we get it now we fully understand what you were saying originally now we get it because we were through the crucible effectively and i was saying that's brilliant uh, but then i i said you know it's like groundhog day or something for me because i go from one town to another and by the end the people get it but then i get back to the next town and it's like uh you have to convince people from scratch and to, to tell someone who's never heard any of this before and has all the media on top of them to say trust me and they say who are you and you go well i'm me <laughs> it, it, it's just very hard to it's just like groundhog day or 50 first dates you have to start all over again and it's that's a difficult prospect because you, and of course like I, I i said this to them as well you know they said more stuff to me it was more relevant but i said to them it's um it's uh, if I told you at the very start, let's say the first night I went to Ross Cray or if I met you or, if, you know, at the early outset of it, and I told you, I know you're being told these so-called far right people are bad and you shouldn't talk to them. But here's the thing is that they're the only people who actually really agree with you and they're no more far right than you are. And, and the whole thing is a psychological operation and you have billions in state funding for NGOs and media, the media, they're calling you racist. <laughs> The reaction, the appropriate reaction isn't to prove to them how not racist you are, because that's actually what they were wanting you to do. That's the point of it. So your intuitive reaction to prove them wrong, that you're not bad, is actually, is, is you falling into the trap. That's what it is. It's a well-oiled machine that they have done hundreds of times, and they know exactly what they're doing. And it is a well-oiled machine. It's coordinated and planned. And it's been, it's got psychology behind it and all this, like, this is crazy. You're dealing with an absolute machine here that is more deeper and more devious than you could ever believe. Anyway, I, what I said to her is that if I had like put what you seem to have learned in the last few months caught up quickly on like a quick crash course, if I put the stuff that you claim you're aware of now, if I put that to you on the first night, you would have thought I was crazy. And she was like, I would have yeah like it's it's hard it is hard to believe and yet only through going through that crucible do i know it's not crazy because i i didn't have to believe someone i have seen it all pan out exactly as described by the so-called boogeyman that i wasn't meant to talk to 
exactly what they said is what happened and here we are um, so in one sense, there's the kind of black pill of like, oh, you have to start again every time. But then there's the white pill or the optimistic side of things where it's like, well, they did get there. And they told me that they are working all the time on getting people into their WhatsApp groups. They are finding out which gun beans are buying up and renting all these properties to, uh, to, to rent out to these um, fake asylum seekers and whatever. Uh, you know, the, the meat factories hiring and these, Matt Tracy from Grip did a great piece on this. The meat factory is hiring, basically using these people as cheap labor. All the corruption left, right, and center around this. And I, and I, then I did say, I said, I know there's a bit of loyalty to like the likes of Shane Lee and Lowry. I'm sure they break down the pub or buying the flags for uh, the under 12 scam match and, you know, all this kind of stuff in there. Like it's kind of a sacrilegious to almost question them. But at the end of the day, that's a political nut you have to crack. People there have to understand that they can vote for different people. You know, you don't even have to be an enemy of, let's say, Shane Lee locally. You can like him and just say the position you took on that isn't wasn't appropriate according to me. So I still like you, but I'm going to vote for someone who says what we want. So, you know, or maybe you can say what we want and do what we want, and then you compete in the democratic arena. You know, it's like trying to drill that message in to be like, you know, if this is a democracy, you are allowed to actually have it. You know, it, it it's not some sort of um loyalty cult to some for based on nothing you know um so anyway but like these ladies got it and they're basically i just thought it was crazy because they went from being completely blind to begin with to now they are effectively full-time nationalist activists working all the time in their local you know the way mammies are and um, working all the time and they're effectively getting other people into it and as time goes on ross cray i suppose they didn't become politicized the way i would have liked them to have to begin with but perhaps there's a seed left there that will grow and flourish over time. So that was uh, great to see um, that Ross Cray is not a write-off, basically. Um, people are getting it. And that's always been my contention, is that even if you fight the battle on an asylum centre locally, because it's the perfect sort of um, platform, obviously, because it's so in your face, to... to uh, politicize local areas one by one and even if you lose which most of the time thus far you sort of will because that's just how we live in a totalitarian state but um even when you lose if you fight the battle against it while it's happening vigorously as if you expect to win sometimes you do but always expect to win have that sort of passion and go forward on it and um, even if you end up losing hopefully what you have is that Pyrrhic victory where in the end uh, a northern town got radicalized even in the likes of say Uchtarad and uh, Ross Lake House and all that kind of stuff you know Uchtarad won that time but then somewhere within and the way Irish towns work as well is that it will encapsulate a 50 kilometer radius around it you know usually a town will kind of it's not just the town it's a it's a hinterland so that whole hinterland will basically go from being completely blue-pilled completely oblivious to all this stuff to having a real life crash course and stuff that I take years to learn and I speak about to you and all that kind of stuff and it's very long winded. They get a crash course in that just in reality over the course of like a month where they see NGOs and journalists and PSYOP and like it, one of the big things is that the journalists basically give them bad coverage to start with and then as the town cocks out or sort of uh, bends over, the, they start to give them better press and it's sort of like a Pavlovian thing. I've spoken about all this before but you know, no one would believe you if you told them that. If you told them that that's how you're reacting is wrong and they're actually, they're, the, the, it's not what, them calling you racist is, uh, that's designed to make you do a certain thing, you know. So the best thing you could do is not do that thing, surely. They, people just can't buy that. They can't buy the NGO thing. They can't buy the corrupt, corrupt politicians thing. It's just too hard to swallow, too hard to believe. And yet, two months later, when the asylum center is in and all the politicians who were down there sweet talking the local protests have disappeared and you've realized who the ngo person was and you've realized that the media actually basically they started by calling you racist and then they sweetened it up as you started to play ball and then they packed their bags and went off to the next town and actually had you just stood your ground um the world would have kept turning had you said Oh, we don't care if you call us racist. That's uh, ridiculous, and we just don't care, basically. We're going to proceed with the same spirit we started with, and we're not going to ever apologize or say, I'm not this and I'm not that. We're going to keep our psychological strength. 
And if we do, what are you going to do? The media are basically bluffing. You can't actually cancel a whole town. That's the thing. So it's like, just hang in there and the media will be on to the next thing in like a week. But people in the moment don't get that. They just, it's too much pressure. It's hard to take. Um, but uh, I'm kind of going on a bit, but um, point being, um, point being, um, people don't get it, but over those few months, they do get it. And you've seen in places like sort of that, whatever that region is, the gateway to Connemara, that sort of general area, um, is that they might not believe you to start with, and then the next step they do kind of believe you, but they try something else, or they, they, they're still a bit weak. And then it happens, basically we're at the point now where some towns, or some overall hinterlands, are on round three. So it's kind of like, oh yeah, you might have lost on all those rounds, but the benefit from the point of a national movement is that all of these areas are slowly being t turned completely black on this regime, and they're getting wise to all of its tricks, not necessarily because I'm telling them or anyone else is, but just through experience. And then we come in and we say, well, we're telling you that the whole time. And they call us far right. But of course, they'll call anyone far right who is effective in resisting what they're doing. Anyone who is hip to what they're doing and is non-apologetic and understands the whole thing is going to be labeled far right. So if you don't want to be far right, you have to be weak and confused and inevitably defeated so you're going to have to pick your poison in a way really like and you're just going to have to walk through that whole thing and just ignore it um and like i say you know you shun a person based on what they say not on what someone else says about them that type of thing like you need to because basically and that's always my view for the whole nation is that once you get to the point where you crack that nut where people are just done um and they, they will not listen to some random rat voice in the corner who tells you you shouldn't talk to him. They'll say, no, no, I'll just listen to the guy himself. Like, there's no, I don't see why people should be blacklisted. In fact, you should be suspicious of someone who tries to blacklist another too much. And uh, you should probably lean towards the person who they're saying is the boogeyman. Because that's more than likely the right thing to do. If you aim to either defeat the movement locally of, of my, uh, mass movement of my fake asylum seekers into your area and as a national movement and that's the thing as well to realize to get towns to out of this clannish mentality of like oh it's just about our town and it's not about anything else it's like no 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 you will not defeat the state on that if you're lucky enough to pull off an ukta ride circa 2018 19 whatever it was well they'll be circling back around the next time so it can only happen as a national movement if at all so um all of these things basically get learned and as i'm talking to these women i'm not trying to lecture them I'm just, we're going back and forth, and I realize that they they totally get it. They they ninety five percent get it right, um, and and uh, they're well on their way, and loads of other people are too. So that was a a cause for optimism. So then there's the last thing in regard to the Sean Me and uh, this is kind of I'm talking about the Sean Me and thing, but I'm not as well. I'm just talking about the the politics within the Sean Me and situation, um. I know I keep scratching my eye. I just have a, like, I've been sniffing and uh, sick all day. So I have like itchy eyes, richy red, sick eyes. So um, basically, yeah, without like giving away or uh, divulging conversations had with Sean Mean or conversations he had with other people in my presence. Actually, first I'll give you a little, I'll set the table. So I've been seeing on, and this isn't a breach of any sort of confidence. There's a page locally called save sean's cabin right anyone can join it it's either open to the public or it's oh like it's either unlocked or it's locked but like all you have to do is just join you know so again this isn't me like uh dragging a, a nice local thing into a grander political discourse or whatever this thing is open for anyone to see it's it's effectively public knowledge and i'm just commenting on it i'm not naming names i'm not throwing shade i'm not trying to cause consternation within that movement or that group at all but i'm just i'm just telling you my view on a certain thing politely there is sort of within that group as there is always with these things the situation is when you get into it and i'm talking about this facebook group but this is just the general movement the facebook group is a representation of the overall narrative war that happens around these things so what you'll get is Everyone in the comments are saying, this is typical for any any similar situation. Everyone in the comments is saying, 
while when they're giving like modular homes to Ukrainians who are driving around in uh, Porsche Cayennes and they're from like Western Ukraine and they're not in any war anyway. And there's Algerians and there's Albanians and there's Georgians and there's people who have been living in London for the last five years getting free houses without planning permission. Um, and uh, meanwhile, Sean has been kicked out from having a lovely cabin on his own land, beautiful, not offending anyone. Um, and as I said on the day, I said, if you actually boil it down, Sean is being is being harassed legally um, because he's Irish. And I'm not just saying that as some sort of political sort of um, bit of um, rhetorical wizardry. My bloody eye, lads. I should have brought sunglasses or something. But um, it's not uh, it's not just a piece of rhetoric for me to say that because there are people living in modular homes sean's home is a form of a modular home there are people living in modular homes that don't have planning permission all over the country and they're going up by the hundreds against the wishes of the vast majority of the local and national populations staunch staunchly against the wishes if that's a correct way of putting it um against the staunch wishes i don't know um so that's happening and of course the essence of planning laws because they say the judges love to say in these situations but down their noses the law is the law um well it's like well the law is the law when they want it to be the law but of course at the stroke of a pen or at the wave of a hand the law isn't the law you know and that's the issue is that um is that these modular homes are going up without planning permission for thousands of people uh, sorry what i was going to say is that the essence of planning law yeah, there's the details, the surface details of planning law, but what the law is based on is the idea that it's incongruent with the local area. It's incongruent architecturally, socially, infrastructurally, whatever, with the local area. And the local people should have a say, and there should be a set of conditions that maintain a certain amount of harmony so that, yes, new developments go up, and yes, new properties go up, as they must, but it's done in a proper way according, ultimately, and this is the heart, really, of planning, I suppose, is that the state is acting as a mediator between the new development and the surrounding community, the people who already live in developments or houses or whatever you want to call it, the people who already live there are more or less okay with what's going on. And it, it, you know, it's just like the state is an arbiter of violence and they're the ones who make arrests rather than people doing tit for tat retribution or whatever. In terms of planning, the role of the state is ultimately planning is based on that. So if you have a situation where as in NACE, Pastures New Limited, this horrible corporate entity, that is making a fortune putting these migrants in matchboxes basically in the middle of a mucky field and uh putting dressing it up in this pr and taking these massive uh so, uh grants or, or fees from the state to do it raking it in the amount of gombinery involved in that is unbelievable and they're just shutting up the walls the local community are out on mass protesting it not just one or two objections from a local which can often um can often sink a planning application, not just one or two, everyone basically. And in that sense, the state goes, well, there's no planning permission. Everyone is against it. They're modular homes. They're being done en masse. And the state says, that's fine. Whereas Sean Meehan has a nice little cabin on his property, his own property. He has not taken anything from the state. Basically, no one in the community, virtually everyone is in support of him. That's, a, that's clearly evident. And uh, he's not really harming anyone, and they're deciding to pick on him. Also, the connection between these modular homes and this importation of migrants is what causes people across the country to have to live in sheds out their back or mobile homes or, you know, cobbled together cabins and all of this. So the hypocrisy and the untenability, if that's a word, um, of this goes beyond this kind of the law is the law thing. It's like the law is a tip of an iceberg based on the bottom of the iceberg, which is what underpins the law. There, you know, this this whole idea, these Latin phrases, the basis of Western uh, private property and democracy and law and all this kind of stuff. There are fundamental tenets to these things that underlie the law, such as the law must apply equally to everyone. So if I go get a parking ticket and I say, okay, fair enough, like you're not meant to park there, that's a rule. I didn't like getting the ticket. I feel like it's a bit unfair. You could have left me off, but I suppose the law is the law, right? Because people can't just park everyone if we did that, and you know, so I'll have to just take it on the chin, you know, uh, bitterly and just accept it because the law is the law. 
Um, and there's, there is a principle underpinning it, there's the, which is that there must be order kept and so be it. But then if there's a guy pulls up next to me and he's got no parking ticket either and he's not meant to be parked there and he gets out and walks away and shakes hand with the guard and I say, why didn't he get a ticket? And he said, oh, because he's my buddy or he's got red hair or he's tall or he's short. I, the whole thing falls apart. So it's like, yeah, well, it, it is the law, but the problem is, is that it doesn't apply equally and it's completely hypocritical and there's no justification of it whatsoever. And um, so when all these people say, oh, well, planning is based on this, that, and the other, uh, it's like, it's basically, it's okay for the state to do it, but it's not okay for the person to do it. And it, it, again, this breaches all norms of the relationship, the social contract between the ruling, the rulers and the ruled. It, so it goes beyond just the cabin. It really does. It goes beyond just a minor planning dispute. This whole thing is centered around the immigration debacle and the corruption of the state as regards the immigration debacle, if we can call it that. Um, everything revolves around this cabin and Sean Meehan, this whole broader picture. And the reason I bring up this kind of Facebook group and some of the local diff differing views on the Sean Meehan situation is because you will see in the likes of this Facebook group, everyone is bringing up this bigger picture. Effectively, the cabin is inextricably linked to the bigger situation and vice versa. The whole saga, it cannot be seen in isolation because if you see it in isolation, then there's an argument for why he should be overruled and it should be taken in because you come back to the parking ticket analogy. I would agree, just like with parking tickets, things we don't like in the individual circumstance. I would agree that, well, I suppose planning law has to draw a line somewhere. And I suppose we could all be building, you know, stone castles and mud huts and, you know, um, glass cubes. And all. We could do whatever we want, wherever we want, buy a patch of land, squat on a patch of land, do whatever you want. And of course, we live in a madhouse, right? That's not going to work. So there has to be a line. And basically, in order for planning to be put into effect and enforced where it's easily objectionable, you also have to enforce it where it is a sympathetic case where you think, well, let's, that one's not actually that bad. And um, I don't think he's really harming anyone. There's an argument for, well, the law must be the law. You know what I mean? And, and unfortunately, maybe you can take care of him in another way, sort him out another way, maybe go through the planning process again for a properly built, like a, a timber frame or a stone or a concrete house or whatever it is. And um, you could make that argument. And I would sort of, as much as I sympathize with him, I think he's such a likable person. And I think his case is very sympathetic. I would have to, as an objective person, say, well, I find it hard to argue that because the law is the law and uh, it has to be drawn somewhere. So fair enough. The essential ingredient is, is what's happening with the modular homes and the plantation centers and no planning uh, and the all of this. So it just can't. It's not just connecting it to migration for some sort of political expediency or whatever. It is fundamentally linked to it. And so, anyway, what you get is people in these groups, immigration, 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 all day long. That's what inspires people. That's what they're talking about. That's just organic. That's what 90% of the comments are on any of these things. And what you have are certain people within that movement. They may have good intentions. They probably do. They're, they start coming in and saying, oh, uh, just a no from the admins and all of this. We don't want uh, we don't want to talk about immigration at all. It's not to do with that. It's not about dislike of individuals. It's not even about immigration or asylum policy. This is strictly about the cabin. We've heard all this a million times in all, all sorts of political scenarios. Basically, there's a taboo in the state, the state enforced totalitarian uh, uh, diktat, making it verboten to talk about that. I mean, uh, it's not for any reason of like bleeding hearts. So people like this, uh, these guys will come in and try to effectively finger wag and police the chat. And they'll say, listen, this is just one of the admin rules. You know, I don't want spats. I don't want bullying. I don't want indecent imagery. I don't, you know, basic house rules. And then they just tack on. You can't talk about this migration thing, basically, right? Because it'll get us in trouble with the media. It's hateful. It's this, that, and the other. So you're basically outlawing what? 90% of people on their own, by their own, without being propagandized to anything, just on their own backs, that's how they see it, naturally, for the reasons I described just previously. Um, so they're trying to be effectively sort of shoo aside, for, for whatever their reasons are, they're trying to um, uh, put that to the side and suppress it 
even though it's not just irrelevant. It's not like, oh, you're just bringing up immigration because you're obsessed with that or something. It's like, it's, it, it is inextricably linked to the situation. And to, to deprive it of that makes it make no sense because for, for one, you can argue that well, the planning laws are what they are. The whole point is that it's not applied equally. That is the whole point of this, in my view, um, as well as just a sympathetic case of a local man, you know, all of that. The, the key to it is that. So it's strategically necessary. Secondly, uh, and some of these people will say, oh, well, we don't want to drive people away or we don't want to alienate people. And it's like, well, how are you, how, could, how does that make sense? Because you're, you're alienating people because 90% of people want to talk about it. Um, so if anything, you're alienating it and you're depopularizing the situation and taking all the passion, the energy, the national solidarity out of it so that it's just going to be a couple of local people piddling around um, you know, so local solidarity. It's great and all that, but you need national support. And the national support comes from, ultimately, people don't just lend their support because there's a sympathetic case locally or they have a quibble about the planning laws here or there. The hypocrisy is everything on this. Um, so it's like none of the arguments really stand up for that. And yet there is that constant quibbling going on, uh, saying, no, you can't talk about that in the chat. It's got nothing to do with it. And it's not just about a chat then, because, of course, that's trying to flow to in the real life situation when you're in Cashel uh, uh, and, and all of that, you're your um that's going to bleed into it too because I, I so that's my point is i'm getting there thinking is this kind of like little verboten situation that's happening in that local facebook group is that bleeding out here and i get there and everyone's talking about immigration um and uh yeah again look you know speaking to sean me and um i don't want to put him on the hook for anything but let's just say i would have wondered is he subjected to all that is he does he is he under that sort of um i don't even know what to call it a form of censorship or or house rules or whatever is he under that and is he sort of going to be like oh well i don't want to talk about that i don't want to talk to you who are you what's going on this uh, kind of very like that uh he's not not at all Um, he understands uh, he's alluded to it too in a video a very good video he did with fatima gunning gripped he kind of alluded to it a bit anyway the, the overall immigration question the, the modular homes for various fake asylum seekers and stuff but like i mean speaking to him i realized that yeah he's he he gets the situation he's cool he's got serious integrity this is just what what i could gather speaking to him briefly uh he's ultimately a boomer and i even said it to him i said look there's a bit of an idea that people above a certain age don't care because they've got their pension they've got their house they're renting out another house they don't really care and uh the great thing is is that he didn't he wasn't just talking about it like oh well this is just about my planning application my house and my livelihood or my home he he wasn't really focusing on that he didn't really say me or i quite a lot at all he he kept mentioning young people who are suffering, who could do with being able to put up a, a, a temporary home in their parents' backyard and save up for a mortgage, and how the country is being destroyed and people aren't being given a chance. His main issue, I mean, let's just say with the immigration thing, he's wise to that. So if I just, I'll say that much. But he's he his he's talking about it from a point of view of everybody else, of younger people in specific, because they are obviously in the main the most affected by the property housing issue which i just thought that was so refreshing to see that because it's lacking also he's just such a cool guy he's got like a sean connery vibe to him he's really cool totally unforgettable type of guy so much gra irish gravitas to him and uh i just i i felt well, as i was speaking with him and a few others i i felt uh it was funny because killian murphy could rock up there and i would just think I don't really care, probably a wanker, to be honest, and I'm not interested, right? But when he kind of approached the group of people I was talking about, I realized I was involved in a kind of circular conversation with him. I felt uh, I felt the honor. I felt like, wow, this is, um, this is a man taking a stand in a key moment in history, and I have the privilege of standing here speaking to him. This is amazing. This is uh, such a big deal. And I felt like a fan, basically. And I and that's who the people we should be admiring as well, by the way. But um, but it was it was it was crazy, you know, because I I've been such an admirer from what I saw. There was that grip piece and various other things, um, and he just totally lived up to the hype. Speaking to him, such an honourable guy. He didn't question who's who or any of that kind of stuff, and he was totally open about his views. And he is totally un unbroken and sort of uh, 
um, stand up on all. He's not afraid of the, these taboos or any of that. Um, and m most importantly, he's doing it mostly for other people. So if someone said, sh I'm just speculating here, if someone said, Shauna, you know, we're going to do a little sly thing here where you can kind of get away with it and this whole thing will die off and move on. You can just live out in your cabin. I think he is committed to the cause in a sense that he doesn't want to, and again, I'm speculating, this is not his verbatim from him, this is just the impression I get. I could be corrected, but it seems like he's not, He's he is in it for the cause in the sense that, yeah, he doesn't want to become a martyr. I, I doubt he wants to be in prison. I doubt he wants his home to be destroyed. But I don't think he'd be satisfied with just getting away with it himself. The way you see often with asylum center towns and stuff like that, for example, where people are like, if we could just get away with it and move it on to the next town, it's such an ugly attitude and sad attitude. And to see an older guy like that happy to take the stand um, on the overall issue. So that's partially the immigration hypocrisy, generally speaking, just the state. And he kept talking about it just beyond the housing. The state of the country for young people loves Ireland cares about the youth cares about everyone in ireland cares about justice and integrity to meet a person like that to me is is a, a complete privilege and an honor and uh so you know i walked away from that day just delighted and i was speaking to derek as well that day and we had lunch and stuff and um, derek's another top-notch guy as well but to to meet these people and then these ladies from ross cray and then these lads there you realize that like there are thousands of people across the country it's a bit of a cliche and waking up waking up to this stuff getting involved and they have integrity they're not political schemers it's not the dark arts it's not game of thrones they just genuinely care about what's going on in terms of what's being done to them in their personal lives but the bigger picture as well and it's such an inspiration and in a way um this has come up a few times people talk like this in these situations in real life they'll say you know it's actually quite inspiring to have this this sense of nationhood and the sense of national solidarity and the idea of recoiling and striking back figuratively against uh oppression oppression tyranny denationalization lies and all of this and uh the miserableness of living under this kind of tyranny to actually come together with people and go no we're talking there we're getting to know each other like i absolutely love it and i came away so white-pilled and so optimistic from that day because it, I almost can't put it into words. I realized something through all those interactions that we are into serious territory here and it's going to be very difficult, but it's, it's, it's also a cause for um, something really special, a privilege to live in a certain moment of history and to get to know people. Because if you lived in um, prosperous times, just occupied by nothing but consumerism and shallowness and artificiality and material uh, gain and all that um you know yeah it's nice and all but everything is fake everything is about oh how new is your car and are we all going to this uh you know whatever weekends away in hotels and this that and the other just this constant pleasure quest um there's something there is something lacking in that and uh as times get tougher and as the situation gets so obscene people do find their humanity and peoplehood with each other and a very special thing basically it's, it feels like history repeating itself in a good way sort of but um yeah and just inspiring as well not to go to a place and see everyone like a bunch of sheep and totally afraid and weak and willing to betray you on the spot you know talk to you and get on very well and you know someone like me i could i could give you my frank view straight away and they say i agree with you totally but once the media turned up the heat they would say he was manipulating me and i didn't like him and I, oh, I don't know what happened. They came here, but they're not welcome. Like that's such a de demoralizing experience because basic humanity should have, there should be some integrity, you know? Um, and, and I found so much of that by going to this hearing for Sean. And uh, yeah, great thing. So moving on swiftly, um, what will I get to next? Uh, so I wanted to talk about the John McGurk thing. Yeah, this is a bit more sort of, it's like I'm not all that, much prepared for it so it's an article on grip basically i mean i don't know am i running out of steam to talk about this one but uh, uh i suppose it's on the title so i might as well 
uh, it was just an article. I mean, I gave you the background earlier on my my sort of ideas. Like, I'm I am not an enemy of John McGurk or Grip to any of that stuff. But there is, of course, this tension between this kind of founding stock of this sort of organic nationalism YouTubers and you know all, even anon accounts and stuff like that that have been around who are like um, very un like unbridled. You know, they say it like it is, and it's this whole culture. And then there's this gripped entity, which is sort of um, more establishment right, and it's sort of acceptable within the halls of uh, government and, you know, the connections to AIN2. And I needn't go on, I suppose, but there's that kind of tension there. And, of course, gripped benefits the former, and the former benefits gripped. And so in one sense, it's a mutually beneficial relationship, and in another sense, there's there can be an underlying antagonism and all that. And as I always say, I have skepticism of, McGurk because of the Israel thing and his previous involvement in all these conservative movements kind of keeps popping up and sort of chumminess with the establishment, you know, naturally a little bit skeptical, but also, you know, an admirer of his talent and intelligence as well, intelligence as well. So, and then of course the writers for Gripped even more so, I, I, a lot of them I have no skepticism towards, I, I'm losing my speech. No skepticism towards. I admire everything they do, and I, I I have no doubt as to their integrity. Um. So again, it's a complicated relationship. It's very nuanced, and there's a lot going on with it, and uh, it can be murky and strange as well. So anyway, that was the kind of general background, and it was one of these cases where McGurk wrote an article. I have to find it, and I won't read everything because it's it's like strictly speaking paywall. I'll just read excerpts, but um. I'm like reading a text here from someone now. Um, but uh, I'll just find the article because I have it here. But uh, it was basically his, uh, the title was Winning the Neglected Middle Ground on Immigration. And he come, he goes on to basically, he names Philip Dwyer, he names others. He recently did a thing too on Ferg, Fergus Power, going into the cafe, kind of, uh, you know, speaking a bit passionately and, uh, you know, whatever, people have different views on that. Like, I didn't think that was a great idea and whatever. Like, you know, take Phil, take Ferg, take any of these people. I don't like everything they do. They don't like everything I do, I'm sure. It's not one big fan club either. Among any of us, we're, you know, whatever, we all have our hits and misses and our own views on what's a hit and what's a miss. But yeah, McGurk recently put out a thing on that. Basically, took the opportunity to throw the knife in on Ferg. And it, I could even agree, yeah, you know, maybe going in on that guy was ill-advised. So be it. But he, he, when does McGurk went out of his way to take the opportunity to, you know, go in on that? And he has a whole justification, very intelligent, addresses almost all the criticisms I could make of him doing that. He he starts his article with that. Um, and yet, you know, I still would have my criticisms even with all that. Um, but that is what it is. That's an individual case. And then within the same few days, he puts up a thing where he's talking about the middle ground right in Ireland against immigration and how oh, Phil Dwyer's terrible and all these people are, I mean, I don't want to quote the whole thing, but he says there's effectively uh, the, the likes of Philip Dwyer and Paul Murphy are two sides with the same coin and Paul Murphy and the far left legitimize the likes of Phil by giving him more importance than he actually should deserve, etc., etc. And that the real big mid-ground centre should be the likes of the, the world of GRIP, the world of AIN2, the world of independent Ireland, which I have views on as well. I don't know if you want to hear those, but that there's this new centre ground they're trying to create and effectively shave off or gatekeep all these others. Now, you can have criticism of Ferg and the cafe or this or that or the other, but what caught my attention was not so much his criticism directly of Philip Dwyer or Ferg or anyone else. It could be me even if he if he wanted to, but it's that it's the the kind of point I felt like he was sneaking in with all that. So it's like, okay, I'll take my pot shots at Ferg and Phil and I'll pick moments that are uh uh I, I can describe as lamentable and all this. And uh that that is what it is. Okay, take your pot shots, but He's kind of sneaking in in that subsequent article about this new center ground anti-immigration uh, view in, the, in in Ireland. He's sneaking that in, really. That's the that's the real uh, um, the guts, the the bulk of the point, really, as opposed to picking on individual incidents or whatever. And what he's effectively saying is that is that these YouTubers and these so-called far rights or whatever are 
blood and soil nationalists and they want to kick all the foreigners out and they're basically like like completely unhinged radicals that have no one can ever listen to uh because it's just so out there it's like the flip side of paul murphy and all of this and we the in twos of this world are putting forward a moderate reasonable view that the population can vote for now just like any mcgurk piece about 80 percent of what he's saying has a lot of validity to it and my quibble would be on the 20 percent first off there's the idea of of the kind of gatekeeping thing and taking pot shots uh, at other people who are on the same track as you basically but they're just a bit you're describing them kind of as riffraff or you know not polite enough or whatever um you know you don't see the and i felt like this about the pro-life thing too this idea of some sort of respectability and to try to chase uh this kind of polite respectability in some way like uh you know this kind of stuff of like una malali or one of these people will just call even a center-right person the demon far-right fascist lunatic they will just go full Saul Alinsky, right and then on the other side you're going to be the better man and you're going to be very magnanimous and respectable and like um presidential or whatever they used to say about trump that kind of a, a, attitude at the time during the pro-life stuff with mcgurk specifically i felt like well look since 2016 we've moved on from that i think the right has grown a pair of balls now and this whole thing is nonsense uh these people are effectively enemies the state is being an enemy it's 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 unhinged and extreme it's not just paul murphy's extreme fina gale are extreme. they're all extreme and they haven't just lost the plot and they're not just uh deluded by ngos the whole thing is rotten to the core and it demands a radical response also we took 250,000 immigrants in in 2022 alone and then there's all the illegal stuff the human trafficking a lot of stuff that gripped to their credit documents very well but the situation is so extreme the idea that you come forward and patter tobin coming being welcomed graciously onto the telly uh every couple of weeks and a sort of political insider like him comes on and says well you know i think uh, the passports should be kind of checked you know and i think them you know but racism is terrible it's the worst thing ever you know worse than worse than immigration worse than mass immigration would be racism alleged so-called this kind of attitude is uh not good and if we had taken that if these riffraff youtubers and uh, or kind of independent content creators and activists for years had been taking that line then we would be in instead of being in 2024 we'd still be in 2018 right we only got here by people kicking the door in and of course this is not a quibble or some sort of petty sort of a grudge or anything but if that sort of overden window hadn't been blown through by people who put a lot on the line then the likes of a grip wouldn't be able to come into the picture sort of after the fact very well done great editing very respectable careful good optics and all that but that 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 ground wouldn't be there to come in on and of course if you're going to then revert back to the idea that oh well you castigate and uh and uh, malign those kinds of same people and that kind of energy and even if sometimes they miss the ball and there's a fuck up or whatever the idea that you say well these radicals are are to be disposed of or they're to be isolated or or sort of what's the word uh, is it isolated quarantined um well then you're just you're just cutting off all of the energy and there's the symbiosis between the center ground the likes of a gripped and then the other guys it just kind of destroys that thing i am of the belief that a thing like gripped is good and some of the other people on the fringes so-called uh there's a symbiosis there and there's no necessary reason for there to be any issue no he would have his you know read his articles he'll tell you that well no we need to be able to criticize bad behavior and all of this but you know you just don't see people on the left uh, whether it's paul murphy or one of the more i think to know tool or any any side of the liberal equation when there's an outlandish moment from a someone to the way left of Paul Murphy you don't see Fintan O'Toole making a point of it you know so it's just it creates an asymmetry there where um, and and then you just question what are the intentions what is what is John McGurk's what inspires and informs him is he just a I suppose he would just claim to be a journalist or something like that or some sort of operator PR person gun for hire I don't know he keeps coming up but uh whereas these sort of organic creators just have their heart on the sleeve and it's that i just want to stop this stuff it's not a game it's not some sort of operation 
it's real. We care about it. And at the end of the day, being Padder Tobin on the TV, reaching out to the middle ground of Ireland that middle Ireland can accept, say, giving the most milk toast, ineffectual um, take on a solution to the problems, while also condemning in the strongest of terms the same people who effectively put those ideas into the public realm from a very dark and very verboten place. It just it just doesn't it's a non-starter from an objective point of view it doesn't matter whether you're john mcgurk and to me anyone else if you just look at it sort of almost scientifically that is just a weak situation you don't want that and um, and the idea like and it's funny because his article i could go into the quotes here it's it's funny because he's kind of in a way he lays he caveats himself to say that no the immigration thing is out of control and it does demand certain what you could call as radical i suppose in this day and like currently perceived as like stringent measures to stop immigration and so i'm kind of left going well what do you actually disagree on then? is it just someone making a few faux pas like some random youtuber or what is the firewall you're trying to create and he he, he goes on the the crux of it because he ends up saying that i'm just reading it here on my phone but he ends up saying like Ireland has too much immigration. It should be, he used the word, dramatically reduced. Uh, citizens should be put first in certain situations with caveats and la, 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 la. And I'm kind of thinking, well, I largely agree with that stuff as a general rule. So what is the dispute then with the riffraff YouTubers and the anonymous, the online, the, the grassroots, the basis of this whole nationalist movement in Ireland that gripped ultimately coasts off of, right? Um, uh, what's the dispute? And he brings up blood and soil nationalism. I'll just quote it here. On the other fringe, there are those who effectively advocate in response, blood and soil nationalism in response to the crazy immigration situation. Or to put it in language one might recognize from social media, Ireland for the Irish, implied intentionally or otherwise is the statement that is uh, in this statement is the idea that Ireland is not for other people, which is why it is often accompanied by calls for mass deportations, including people who've lived here for decades and contributed. Lacking in the statement is any definition of what Irish is or how it might be defined. Many who use it, for example, do not recognize legal citizenship as a useful marker of Irishness, arguing that it has been cheapened by being granted too easily to those of foreign birth. Always with the caveat, he's a slippery operator. Even if you accept this point, so like I'm not accepting this point, but even if you do accept this point, straddling the line, uh, however, there is no immediately, ob immediately obvious answer from them as to how Irish should be defined, uh, because that would make Joe Biden Irish or more Irish than Bradford. And it's kind of like, so the crux kind of comes down to, you do agree, it's debatable to what extent, but you agree to some point that immigration should be dramatically reduced and curtailed and all of this, effectively what we say as well. And you you grant sort of, what do you say? It was, um, even if you accept the point that like paper Irish is a real thing, the idea that like, hey, if you're going to hand out a passport to like a million people, many of whom, like we saw with the stabber on Parnell Street, um, people who've been living here for like a decade, they have their piece of paper that says they're Irish and they can't even speak English, not mind Irish, you know, and they've absolutely no integration. Like it, it, the, the piece of paper is illegitimate and how you strip citizenship or whatever is that's a, another question i've written about that as well like a more detailed idea of like well how would you go about this and um, that's kind of debatable but like so you're half condemning the idea of stripping people of citizenship basically what you're saying is that if you're going to stress the idea that ireland is for the irish which doesn't mean kick out every foreigner by the way but that it's fundamentally for the irish people i.e what as he says himself blood and soil nationalism which is a scary term but at the end of the day, it's just about the idea that nationalism is connected to blood, ancestry, blood and soil is sounds scary, blood being ancestry and soil being the place where you are, ancestry and place, right? That That is a fundamental thing. It's like, well, like, are you against that? Is there something wrong with that? Or does, it, does the immigration... Uh, quam have to be purely rooted in well econ economically it doesn't make sense from a the point of an administrative region it's sort of illogical because it overwhelms services and all that it's like well yeah we can all agree on that but is there why is there something fundamentally wrong with saying i'm from here my ancestors have been here for in my case probably and maybe a lot of people th thousands of years and um, or whatever just here for a long time and ireland is mostly made up of those 
Is there a fundamental problem with that? Is there something wrong when that is the case in Japan or Zambia or wherever, Russia, right? What's wrong with that? Why is that some sort of uh, grounds to isolate a certain wing of the movement that you seem to be kind of part of? Why are you drawing the line there and why get hung up on it? Also, the question of what exactly is Irish, which I'm sure he would come back to again and again. It, the trouble with that is that that's what Antifa say. Um, so you're kind of bringing in these little, picking these little holes and what it effectively comes down to is, well, how are you going to define Irish? Listen, that's a question that has been asked for years by these kind of globalist people, Antifa and all of that. And it's asked by them because it in, in oftentimes can successfully undermine a nationalist argument. Because, of course, put aside some uh, like, you know, hardcore anons in the chat being funny or whatever. The reality is, is that so-called blood and soil nationalism, so-called Ireland for the Irish, so-called where do you draw the line? It isn't absolute. It's not like you have this thousand year DNA test and all of this kind of stuff, even in my view. Someone, some Polish guy who's been here 20 years, and this is where people, some people dispute it, but somebody who's been here a long time who is a good person, they respect society, um, they, they, this whole thing of, like, do they have jobs and all that, but they basically tick the boxes. They're, they're just good, decent people who've integrated into society. Into society. They, have, um, they have a stake in the society, and they respect it, and it's within reasonable numbers, and it's, they've been around a long time even if you dispute that in practice that's that you can't get rid of that that is just fair enough in my view um and basically there's a certain amount of that that's tolerable that you will always have immigrants in your society you will always have people who become naturalized or citizens you even have that in china which i spoke about a lot even in china which is the most anti-immigration country in the world there's a there's a degree of that and then in ireland there will always be a degree of that it's just a question of where to what extent and i don't and no one ever could have a solid answer, a defined answer. And you're you're being totally spurgy if you claim to have that answer. It's a spectrum. It's a spectrum that's either moving one way or the other way. You're either being totally replaced and overwhelmed and denationalized in your own country and, and all of that. Or the opposite is happening. Your national identity, a solid demographic, a, uh, a reproductive population, um, diaspora coming back the fringes of the migration thing being dealt with so you start with the 250,000 spoofers who came here they go and then you move on to the next thing and it's not a case that it never ends and you're rounding every last person up who isn't here for a thousand years it's a case of a spectrum that's the reality of the world you don't have to really worry about someone who's like half Irish half Polish born here 20 years ago sounds like they're from Port Leash with a big heavy port leash accent on them and they live here and they totally identify as irish and all of this kind of stuff you don't have to be going doing a 23 and me on them and being like crazy to look at these almost like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people who are here now some of whom have passports and say that all has to go now you unfold that and there's like 10 questions well how do you do that what about the eu what about this what about that La, 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 la. You can get into those. And you take each of those and you unfold it and there's more. But the general governing principle would be that, well, no, you are trying to reestablish Ireland for the Irish. Slowly and gradually and only up to a point at the end of the day. Because, first off, that's all you would desire. I, I'm not a lunatic. And also, it, it's not practical. Someone who says otherwise, it's just not practical. But what is practical is to take... The spoofers who've come in here on 40 buses being dropped into a community who are completely hostile, have no rights anyway, even according to all this international law, they're out um, to deconstruct the NGO industry. Again, McGurk would kind of agree with me on a lot of this stuff. So it's kind of like, again, you're back to the question of you're granting us the a lot of the premises. So where even is the dispute? It's some sort of liberal orthodoxy about well you can't say ireland for the irish even though why not explained um what is irish which is just this totally piddling antifa to your question it's like what is irish is on a spectrum obviously there's someone who's been here like uh, ancestrally thousands of years and they speak irish and all of this kind of stuff and then there's there's the 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 algerian who just got off the boat and is like you know 
stoned out, out of his head wandering around the village looking for a little girl who's going for a jog or whatever right there's like there's like that's the two ends of it and it's just, and then there's the administrative citizenship the idea of a passport which i think probably about 15 years ago or a long time ago we crossed a, a certain threshold or what's the word a rubicon where that became illegitimate right where citizenship being final and concrete and permanent may have been well and good let's say in the 70s if a german lives here for 25 years they basically become irish and and you know whatever and they marry someone and they're very good and um, you can give them the citizenship and you can effectively say yours is as good as mine that means something. this is a very special thing you've been handed now you're welcome to the club when they started doing thousands upon thousands of citizenship ceremonies people who could not speak english people you know ridiculous like we all know what that is that has become illegitimate and the idea that we're going to pretend that ireland for the irish and there being some ethnic core that matters to the country and is relevant and is not verboten or taboo that that is legitimate and reasonable um not some sort of thing that's off the menu that is essential um and then the idea of citizenship as we think of it basically a piece of paper that is also um that is also out the window so again you know it's like he's painting a caricature to say that if you're not just if you're not patter tobin talking basically shite on the tv saying something about like the the lowest hanging fruit ridiculous just trying to hoover up the political capital out of it with no real intention to change the situation at all on mass um you know that's not going anywhere um it might go somewhere politically as as mcgurk suggests oh well you want the center ground of the country and all that yeah you might be able to sort of sweep in after this political capital has been created because that's the corrupt nature of this democratic system with controlled media and everything's arranged that's a unfortunate tragedy of how these things work perhaps john mcgurk himself plays a role in that system we'll say um of harvesting political capital and grievances towards a a accepted sort of um you know pre-arranged place um and uh that's all well and good but it's not going to change the situation unfortunately um and he could say oh, well no i i suggested drastically reducing it and all that but it's like yeah but you're caught into these taboos again you you're hung up even though you made a caveat you are hung up on the citizenship question and the idea of ethnicity effectively to be blunt being not the be all and end all of irishness necessarily again i believe it's on a spectrum national identity is a fluid thing to a point not like the lefties make it out to be but you know it's that deconstruction that leftist deconstructionism again like if someone says no nationalism is fixed and then i come back and i say well what about the normans what about the vikings what about this and that you know if you want to go down the road of being totally purist and not accept and not accepting that there is actually a spectrum on it then you will be hung up on the norman question and these ridiculous games the fact is it is fluid to a point but at the end of the day it's not without an ethnic characteristic and uh also a piece of paper don't mean anything like if those are going to be your shibboleths that these kind of lines you can't cross it just doesn't make any sense and you're just uh it's sort of like a technocrat um and uh you know the, you're not going to break the system effectively um also as i said hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people have come here already even if you stopped as i believe even if you stopped immigration entirely right now not one more person in the problems that are baked into the country from the 250,000 just in 2022 how many last year how many this year how many today how many before that the problems are baked into the cake and effectively this stuff has to be undone i mean if you're a serious person and you seriously want to reclaim a, a nationhood that makes sense and is tenable and isn't doomed in ethnic strife and bosnia effectively uh you have to reassert the irish national demographic identity um and sort of hegemony within the country and that involves picking it apart effectively it's not about rounding people up and all that in uh, in these dramatic and cruel ways it's just i have a whole post i did on this a couple of weeks ago on twitter um you deport all the people who shouldn't be here if you need to ask that question then i mean i don't know what to tell you 
it's very clear to begin with who obviously shouldn't be here. They need to go. Um, and then you uh, you cut off the supports for people who are here sort of that are harder to get rid of, but they still shouldn't be here. And they really are only here to sponge benefits. I don't want to name groups or types of people, but um, there are certain people, let's say, busying up O'Connell Street who, um, without even have to, having to do anything, you just pull their privilege to be able to commit crime as they want. You pull the benefits and the piss taking that's going on. Easily done. It's just shocking that it happens anyway. You start basically picking away at the issue in a reasonable, humane and normal fashion with the core and open claim that you were trying to get Ireland back for the Irish, not kick every last person out, you know? So I just think drawing these lines of, uh, of like this kind of respectability or whatever, to just say everyone else out here and let's do the N2 thing here and like independent Ireland. Um, and we'll take it from here. It's like, it's not just sour grapes. It's not being, oh, well, I'm the YouTuber and you have this big publication now and you have access to the government and all this legitimacy handed to you or whatever. It really isn't about that for me at all. I've never been a sort of a prideful or whatever like that. Um, I just do my own thing. It's just the fact that, that that won't work. It might work if you're trying to build political capital and if you have an arrangement with the state for access and you have A2 ready there to go on TV and say what they say and then you know votes will go over there for this sort of mealy mouse kind of proposition. Maybe that'll work. But based on the type of people who are involved in that, the lack of integrity, the lack of commitment to any ideal, and the baked in weakness in the policy aspect, and the fundamental rejection of the idea of Ireland for the Irish fundamentally, and of um, and the acceptance of things like piece of paper mattering, you're you're done. You're done. Like uh, reducing immigration now, even to a more manageable number, uh, too late. It's not going to work. Ireland's gone. It's gone. Um, and it can be ret retrieved and it can be fixed, but it requires more radical uh, response. Um, and it's not radical when you consider what's been done already. That's my view, is that it's only as radical in undoing what's been done. It's only as radical as what has been done. Um, it's just an equal measure, equal and opposite reaction. That's my view. Um, what else was I going to say? Is that um, I had a point as well there uh i've kind of forgotten it but uh yeah sorry it's getting late but i you know i just feel very passionately about that and i see like for example gripped and john mcgurk himself a lot of stuff he writes is great but i did there is obviously baked in from the start this idea that it's he is there among other things to create this new political landscape um with all of this energy on the right and the the the, the the energy is created not just by a bunch of YouTubers. I don't claim that. It's created by just the egregiousness of the situation. But it's it's effectively to channel that into a coherent and stable and predictable and acceptable new political centre-right that is immigration sceptical, just like they have with the Tories or Georgia Maloney or whatever else. Um, I am sceptical of that. I don't dislike anyone personally or whatever. I just believe that that is wrong. And there might be nefarious intentions behind it, or it might be just being wrong. I don't know. I don't, I'm not a mind reader, but I just think either way, the fruits of that intention are completely wrong. Um, and uh, yeah, um, I'm not about it. So yeah, that's kind of that. I'm, I'm just trying to see if there's any more from that write up. I hope I'm not mischaracterizing anything. You know, the guy's very careful to kind of caveat himself all the time. I'm just trying to read through all the caveats and all of that and kind of figure out, well, what are you fundamentally saying here? And what's your point, basically? It's kind of, um, it's almost, because uh, I know the point. The point is to create that firewall and and uh, insert Patter Tobin and whoever else into the mix and let them be the champions of uh, immig immigration skepticism. I just, I don't buy it. Um, also, just as a side note, I could say way more about that. I could be more articulate, probably it's late. Um, but whatever, I hope I've said, kind of made the point a little bit. Uh, as regards Independent Ireland, I'm, of course, skeptical of them. You look at, like, they, they've they just put up for election, and I think it's Roscommon or wherever, uh, an RTE journalist, you know? I mean, talk about not good. Uh, Kieran Maluli or something like that. And all of these other, uh, if I'm being honest, 
for the most part, a pack of gum beans who are like basically Fianna Fáil, Fianna Gael type slippery, slippery little snakes. Um, they just put donning the coat of uh, skepticism now. And of course, within that group, there might be a few sincere people. I don't know. But the overall tone I'm getting is that, um, you know, I'm always skeptical. It's, it's like new people can come into the fold. That's grand, obviously. But there has to be a measure as well of, well, and this is relevant to the McGurk question as well, is that it's not about this old guard, these YouTubers, bitter clingers, you know, they, they, they're they jealous of this an expanding movement becoming more mainstream. That's actually a legitimate critique that, you know, that can be true and stuff of people. But there is also something to be said for um, trust being afforded proportionally to people who for a long time before it became inevitable, effectively, um, People who before that have said it, they've said it all the way, no caveats, no bullshit. They've just been really about it and they've had no vested interest, barely got paid, all that kind of stuff, uh, suffered for it. A person like that, obviously, even warts and all, perhaps, right? They are, they're not always perfect. But a person like that, in terms of elections or just respectability or, or clout within the broader movement, there is something to that, that that person deserves a certain respect um, their voice matters more than someone who just rocked up because of course for the obvious reason you can trust the former person you can trust them because they were there the whole time saying it and now they're just still saying the same thing and so if they were hypothetically to get into office you would trust that but they're not here for some cynical reason or for subversive or opportunist or mealy mouth or totally co-optable they are sincere articles and that carries weight and someone who comes in uh, fresh off the boat, so to speak, they might be great. That's brilliant. Let them demonstrate it. But the idea that you just come in and sort of replace a movement with a whole host of palpably slippery, corrupt uh, characters, or at least, yeah, you know, political opportunists, you don't have to be me being on one side of it or biased or personally involved or anything like that to just know that, well, that obviously makes sense, doesn't it? Um, you would trust the former more than you would the latter um, if you actually want success, if you actually want uh, action to be taken effectively politically. Um, it just seems obvious to me. Uh, so it doesn't mean you don't welcome new people or you don't uh, accept a broadening to uh, mainstream respectability. It just means that there's, you know, two things can be true at once. Um, and when I see someone come around, someone like McGurk, and try where he gets the opportunity, where he has an in, to go out of his way to sort of um, uh, deride and diminish. Because uh, he mentioned Philip Dwyer and he had his beef with his Ferg Power and all that. But he is being very broad to say these YouTubers, these far rights, these untouchables and all this, they are, oh, they're just riffraff. They're just like Paul Murphy, um, but on the right or something like that. And they, they want to kick out the Normans and they want to do blood tests on uh, people and, you know, like I, I and and whatever it's kind of like i think it's fair to treat that with a certain amount of hostility and skepticism and uh, that's just that so yeah i keep my eye on those i i it's one of my like i have certain people i follow and like whenever mcgurk pokes his kind of pokes his antennae up like that and uh takes his moments i'm, I'm very keen to pay attention to it because i know i know what's going on basically and i'm sure you do as well so um Anyway, um, but, 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 yeah, at the end of the day, I just care about something deeply and sincerely, and uh, I want Ireland to be fixed, you know. It's kind of simple for me. I, I have no, you know, I can always strike a balance between the purity of original voices and the welcoming of new voices. You know, there are people all over the place, Um Loads of people popping up. There's a guy in Bray, I've forgotten his name. He seems sincere to me. I mean, you know, a lot of people. There's there's new blood coming in. There's a broadening respectability and all that. That is brilliant. I'm I'm against the uh, purists and the Spurgs and the weirdos and all that, trying to hold on to this like insular movement. But then there's the flip side. There's the McGurks of this world too. And I just care. Um, so, yeah. So I've talked about Kulak. I've talked about Sean Meehan. I've talked about McGurk at it again. And uh, oh, Benga, I never talked about Benga. I'm going to leave that off. I, I mean, unless like you're in the chat and you're like up late, it's 20 past 12. I can't. 
you know what happened with him. It was just funny because he ended up um, kind of tail between his legs, making a video acting the victim, and uh, he had just been harassing like mammies and shops and trying to get uh, smaller little kids than him to say the N word, N word, so called, under pressure on the street, basically racially abusing people. In my view, that's racial abuse. I'm not going to bring up the videos. I'll give a quick ramble. I mean, as you know, it was this TikTok guy doing nuisance content, but very sort of like he's a big guy he claims to be a kid himself 16 17 i don't know about that whether he is or not he's 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 built like a grown man right um and he goes up to these smaller kids and women in shops mammies and basically harasses them puts on their accent as well he claims to be irish born and bred or born and raised but he's got a london black accent and he uh he goes around to, yeah, vulnerable people, smaller kids, harassing them, abusing them, abusing little nerdy guys, abusing mammies, grabbing some kid half his size. One of them was, I'll just, I'll actually play one for you. We're here now, might as well. Am I am I wrong to do this? Is this bad? Is it too late? What if, I always check the view count. It's like, if people are getting sick of me, I know if you're all leaving, but, um, but uh, I'll just pull up a quick video maybe. So just like one or two maybe that jumped out at me and I'll make myself smaller here. Um okay, we're doing it. We're doing the Benga thing. Um hopefully this might cause the me to glitch up and stuff. In that case I'll stop, but let's just watch if you let me know if you can hear the bit. If you can hear it. I'm in the right direction and I didn't need no Google Maps. Yeah. You're going good. How's 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 the gym going and everything? Going good. Oh shit! Sure. Yes. I see. I see. You got a fresh trip. Oh man, don't 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 that. Uh, what? Oh, okay. what? It's really intimidating. Uh, I I'm assuming you can all hear it there, but yeah, it's clearly just intimidating and and condescending. You can feel and hear the contempt. Uh, Are you happy, Rob? You too. You. Why? No, 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 you're not recording me. Not recording <laughs> oh. me <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah so actually, like, putting aside all this stuff people are like oh he's african and la 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 and I, like putting aside all that i just don't like bullying like um there's a certain amount of bullying you know this whole idea that you bully someone in a constructive fashion to make them better and to sort of uh put down antisocial characteristics and you know if your friend is a bit chubby and you bully him into getting fit and that's good but this kind of bullying where you just go up to someone who's smaller than you weaker than you and you sort of uh you just harass and intimidate. I like I've I mean like any sane person I'm totally against it I hate it I hate seeing it um but uh let's find a bit more of it here so I have a few so here he's going around the shop this might cause a freeze up I think my computer is struggling a bit so just let me know lads if I'm if it's not working Sorry, they're not mine. What? They're not mine. What do you mean they're not yours? What? Yeah, they're yours. Take them up. They're... And bear in mind, right? Putting aside the obvious, he's a he's a big guy, potentially intimidating, and he's going up to a mother. That could be your man. Um, and putting taking the piss and. She could feel threatened. I, 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 you know, I would if I were her, right? Fair enough, please. But, but you actually give it to you. Fair play to her. She doesn't take a shit. Why? I'll call security. Oh, yeah, sorry. Wait for this now as well, by the way. Despite claiming in his later video, oh, I'm Irish, don't be racist. Uh, he's got his, yo, bro, uh, what's going on? Uh, this, this, like, dumb accent. Um, you know, in a few of these videos, you can hear him kind of putting on this culture accent, which really is him just taking the piss out of an Irish accent. Um, it's uh, someone's man's face in a shop like this, while intimidating. You'll hear it now. What the f*** are you asking for these, though? I didn't ask you. You didn't? I don't remember before. What? Before, you asked me. Don't take your smart stuff. I'm smart than you, cuz. Oh. <laughs> oh. 
Schmerter knew. He's putting on an accent. He's like, look at these, like, uh, culty Irish with their accent. Uh, and then he comes out and says, I'm, I'm Irish too, bruv. Um, what else does he have? Uh, good for you here. It was just disgraceful stuff. Like, there's um, there's a few. One bothered me in particular. I want to find it. Nah, that's your opinion. again i wouldn't like it would just be annoying nonsense content if um i hope i i hope i'm not frozen up like for all i know i'm not even live lad so please just if someone if this is working out okay and you can hear the videos and everything let me know but um it would help be helpful because I, I actually don't know if i'm talking to myself because my computer is such a like clams up when i do anything but um if this was like a 12 year old like a really small little irish kid um going around being a nuisance you'd be like whatever but it's like bros like to use his language is like six feet tall or he's a tall guy like and he's built enough or whatever and he's going around it's like i you don't go up to people that are smaller than you like and women and stuff like that and piss around with them like that that's intimidating like that's you know threatening behavior mm -hmm. that's your dinner man thanks last year okay. okay. <laughs> Like what? What kind of man goes up to a woman of about sixty years old like that? Whether you're taking the piss on YouTube or not, what kind of man goes up to a go up to a guy who's near seven foot tall, built out? Take the piss out of him. Go for it. Maybe try to be funny. That's on you. But going up to like small, you know, elders and stuff like that. And that's the other thing too. Like you go to Africa, for example, right? Um, and they even have language for, as most cultures do, except for like our modern shite culture they have different words that they use well i suppose we do but they have very specific like vocabulary to use towards an older person versus towards someone who's equal to you and all of this right and um, that is built into like everyday conversation and they go you know they talk about auntie and all this kind of stuff like this black culture they even take that to london like this kind of respect for anti asians have it too and stuff so it's the idea that you're here and you're kind of taking the piss out of like an old mammy's country accent and you're looming over people and you're disrespecting elders you know where's the respect for our elders right i i, I don't think i'm going to go over to africa whether i'm born and raised there or or move over there or whatever i don't think i'm going to go up to 60 year old women there i'll have respect for them and i would expect you know bleep i would expect consequences you know reprimand we'll say scolding uh, if i went there and treated older women in that fashion took the piss out of them intimidated them i'd expect to be sorted out um and and rightly so i mean it's just a terrible terrible thing to do it's it's, it's rife with contempt various levels of contempt yeah oh yeah well i know what? That he's kind night. of squaring up to me goes what he what's doesn't the story? Just do the funny thing he's, he's following you him. Hear he's that every night man him. what's going on oh oh Modern Ireland. That's my man, bro. Damn. The other thing, too, is that I actually watch content sometimes where people go up to people in supermarkets, like American channels and stuff, and they act kind of weird, and it's it's like social experiment. It's funny. There, there's something to it that makes it funny. There's like um, Cartnax is a very good American channel about like returning trolleys and stuff that's kind of awkward, can create conflict and stuff. But it's got a point to it and it's funny. This just isn't, this is just raw contempt and bullying. It's nasty and, it, and it's not funny. It's just literally not funny. Like no one could laugh at this. Oh, nice haircut. Nice haircut. Hey, I'm talking to you, nice haircut. Hey, you have like, a nice What is that besides the most crass form of hateful, to use the term we hear a lot, nasty bullying and intimidation nice haircut like uh, you're that's just not even attempting to be funny in any way you're just being a, a c word and um, this one is not the best one but it's the most egregious we'll say now this is where it crosses because people say oh he's african and everything else and that's key to it yeah sure but this is where that actually becomes explicit where this is i consider a true form of racial harassment effectively like in the worst form as well um where he start he grabs effectively the small kid i'll just play it for you but i just want to preempt that like this is a, a, an extreme form of racial harassment 
because he brings up the n-word and all of this we know that's loaded up well if you say that you can be beaten up by a black person a black person if they hear you say that can beat you up and apparently it's justified or whatever right this word is the like this there's, there's more than just a word uh, with all the connotations that you could be beaten up on the spot by the person and apparently it's justified that you could be fired from your job destroyed all this kind of stuff maybe even killed and um, so this word has this power apparently this this card they've been given and he's going around putting little kids on the spot after having and threatened them to say you were you talking about me behind my back like it's just not funny and it's riddled with racial contempt yeah because i'm black you're staring at me yeah yeah you fool he will I'm messing with you. It's a joke. Come down, boy. See there, he puts on. So he starts with you, 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 and then then when the guy responds, he goes, oh la la la. He goes into his uh, supposed Irish accent. Then so again, not only is he saying, oh, are you are you calling me black or you call me an N word, uh, but he's also like then rehearsing back the accent back at them, like it couldn't be more explicit. Hey, what's your name? Come here, Marcus. Come here. So I, so I, I, I heard, I heard you were talking shit about me. No. What? That wasn't me. Yes, it was you. It was not. I heard a lot of people say to me that you were talking shit about me, and it's not all right to be talking shit about a person. No, I, that wasn't. Are you racist? Right. Are you racist? No. What? What's being you know, on? You're not racist. See, again, he's doing the accent, right? You're racist. He's so he's taking the piss out of your man's own ethnicity or race. And then he's using his own race as a massive cudgel because of the taboo that it's all been loaded up with and that the regime has given it. Like, it's like, what a nasty. And here's the thing as well, right? Yeah, it's all racialized and all. Everyone's angry about it. And look at this African or whatever. There are lovely, go, go to Africa. You'll meet some lovely Africans. I mean, not to sound PC about it, but like, there is this, it, it, it maps on to the ethnic and racial uh, totalitarianism within our society and the replacement and the all of that. But it also is just, as well as that, a nasty individual to do this. No. You sure this? You fucking hate black people, man. I love them. You, you love them? Yeah. You're a good man. That's what I'm talking about, bro. We out here, yeah? Yeah. Imagine if you did this as an Irish person, right? You went up to some, and not just anyone, by the way, because he picked on a smaller guy than him, much smaller, right? And uh, he's intimidating himself. Imagine if you're a sort of built enough kind of, uh, you know, kind of intimidating looking enough Irish guy, right? And you go up, uh, you, we don't even, I can't even, and there's no analogous situation for it because we, we don't live in this kind of society. But let's just say you go up to someone and you say, um, you go up to some little woman or something like that, right? Or some little kid, foreign. And you go here, uh, Ireland for the Irish, yeah, and uh, something you know something. It it doesn't really work. It's not analogous. But you go, you could, you could do like that, and then you put their accent on. They reply to you in like a foreign accent. Then you do the or accent back to them, and then just like he does there, you go, oh, are you saying Ireland is for the Irish? You said we're a bunch of this or that or whatever, and then they're intimidated and scared. And then when they say no, no, I love Irish people, then you go, oh, now you're okay, okay, you're safe now. You know, think of how not like that. I mean, talk about hate crime um, and racism and just the ugliest form of uh, racial contempt. This is, you're seeing it here. Say nigger. No. Say nigger, bro. I won't. What, why not? Say nigger. I won't. Nigger? No. Call me nigger. No. So he's going up saying, call me that. And what's at the end of that is that potentially I'll kill you on the spot because I'm bigger than you and I'm intimidating. And he's, the guy's obviously scared, basically, as he should be. Um, I, I'll either knock you out on the spot, I'll kill you, or you'll get kicked out of school, you'll never work again, your whole life will be destroyed. And I'm going to stand over you and say, say it. Okay, I'll let you say it once, just once. I won't. The, the, the one time in your life. I, simp I simply won't. Unbelievable. Um, so... So you've this guy here anyway, and then he comes out, right? Mick O'Keefe and some others put it out online, and it gets collectively millions and millions and millions of views of people effectively posting saying look at this guy see for yourself and everyone goes that's a disgrace la 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 and then he comes out and he starts saying this is really weird you'll see it in a second he's got to suddenly he's all soft he's like so oh, i'm just a little boy i'm being attacked you're all racist right after saying to someone say the n-word call me and whatever um uh after all that, suddenly he's sweet as pie and his voice is gentle, little lamb, and I'm being attacked, and poor me. And uh, 
and he's acting the victim, the cry bully. And oh, I'm just 16, I'm 17, right? It's like, look, whether you are or not, you don't come across that way. Let's put it that way. And uh, um, what's the other thing he does? Oh, yeah, it's just, it's kind of funny the way, weirdly enough, he keeps saying, I'm like, and he keeps stuttering, I'm like 17, I'm like 16, 17. It's kind of strange as well, right? Well, why, like, if, like, I'm 32, right? End of story. I'm 32 years old. I'm not, I'm not 32, 33, 31, 20. Um, so that's kind of strange. But anyway, look at this. Um, after what you've just seen, right? Because I know you're racist. Like, all you guys... All right, so this is to Michael O'Keffe. that's uh, accusing me of bullying and harassing kids. Did he just call him like, Michael O'Keffe? How are you going to tell me? All right, so this is to Michael O'Keffe. that's uh, accusing right. me of bullying and harassing kids. Like... How are you going to tell me I'm bullying harassing kids? I'm literally a 17 year old kid. I don't even have my idea yet. I'm not even 18 and I'm literally still in school. All right. And that's kind of weird because you're telling me that I'm harassing kids, which is clearly a lie. I'm literally 16, I'm 17. And the video you. Now he says, you're sort of trying to say that I'm harassing kids and that's clearly a lie. Now I'm glad we're presenting it this way in stream format, right? Because you just saw the previous video. You saw where he was saying, Say the N-word. Were you talking shit about me? I heard you talking shit about me. Say the N-word. Say it in front of me. Say it. Say it. Now, so you just saw that video, and he just said, I'm going around harassing, harassing kids. That's clearly a lie. I'm harassing I think kids, we know what the lie is. which is clearly a lie. I'm literally six, I'm 17. And the video you posted right there, that was from last year, and I was literally only like 15, 16 at the time. And you only bring that up now. Surely it was a prank, but they're my classmates, my classmates, and you're getting at everyone, like, a lot of people are trying to be telling me that they're going to kill me and shit because of this. Like, they're my classmates, they're not even kids, and you're saying I'm an adult, like, 30, 27, bullying kids, like, it's kind of weird because, like, this is actually has a huge effect on me, like, I'm really, really upset because, like, you're going to social media saying that I'm doing all this shit, which is clearly a lie. Please try, stop trying to lie on my name because I could bring this further, like, you're targeting a kid. Like, how old are you? Like, 40 years of age. You're targeting a kid. I'm not even 18 yet. You're targeting me. Like, I could bring this further if I wanted to. You're getting people after me, training me, saying, oh, yeah, they're going to stab me. They're going to split my... See, the way he's absolutely convulsing on the spot. Man. So he's acting the victim, but he's shaking with aggressive rage, obviously. Um... I mean, to my mind, based on what we've seen, not a nice character in my view, but sure, look. My head open. Like, let's see what you've caused. I know you're racist. Like, all you guys doing this, you're, you're like, you're racist. Like, if, if, if you really believe this guy, like, like, I don't know what to say. Like, I'm an Irish citizen. I was born on Limerick, if you really want to know that. And you're seeing I'm targeting kids. They're literally my age. They're literally one year or two years they're difference than my age. Like, so I don't know what you're saying. Just because I'm big, I'm black, I'm big, I'm black, and I'm tall. That you can't judge a book by its cover. You cannot. Like you're accusing me of harassing and bullying kids. They're literally laughing. They really want to be in the video. I'm literally their age. You do you know you you don't even know who I am. And you're no, does it look like that kid on the street was laughing? He might have giggled in relief as he walked away. A sort of a uh, release catharsis, but uh, no, that kid wasn't uh, having a laugh. Which you all this shit? Like, you can never judge a book by its cover, literally. Like, get bro, get your facts right. Like, I'm 70 years of age, do not be accusing me of anything because I didn't do anything wrong, right? So, please stop trying to get people to try kill me and stuff because I was born here and deserve to be here. I'm an Irish citizen, this is my country, I. Irish citizen, this is my country. Well, he wasn't really acting like it. He didn't act like it was his country. Now, the other thing is, like, you know, I, I mentioned it already, but, I mean, you know, um, I mean, I'd love to know what the guy's response would be if you moved to Africa and you, like, went up to, like, little women and little kids and stuff and you uh, put racially loaded threats and intimidation on top of them, in their face, looming over them, on mic, mic'd up. I mean, it's just objectively nuts. Um, only Ireland in society, like the, the fact that it got this far, obviously he ended up getting kind of his, uh, 
you know, reprimanded and scolded online by people. And I condemn any threats or anything like that, obviously. But, you know, um, you know, the fact that it got this far, the fact that TikTok, like you said, oh, some of this was a year ago and stuff. The fact that it's been up for years, why did the school not take action? Did no one, like, do you remember in Navin, a video came out where a couple of lads threw a few slaps at a guy and called him like F word or gay or something like that. I had like boomers telling me about that saying, oh Jesus, it's awful. You know, at the time. And I thought, because it was all over the RT brain basically, right? And um, it's kind of crazy because I was like, someone was telling me about, did you see the thing in Navin? That was shocking or whatever, because it was memed into their heads by RT. And I, I felt like I didn't want to be, you know, like creating issues, but I felt like saying to these people, when they tell me about it, yeah, that was terrible. Adam Noonan was terrible as well, wasn't it? And they would go, oh, who's that? I've never heard of that. I go, it's the guy who was stabbed in the back, no? By these guys, no? Um, in a typical fashion of the people who did it. Uh, and they stood there and laughed and, uh, and recorded him. You didn't see that one, no? A couple of slaps in Navin, but standard schoolyard stuff, a couple of slaps, a little slur here or there, whatever. It's not good. I don't. That shouldn't happen to people and stuff. But like, it's relatively normal. Like, right, in a sense, it's just uh, what's the word? Uh, garden variety bullying. But you know about that. Objectively, kind of unremarkable. But you don't know about Adam Noonan. You don't know about the boy in Limerick who was kicked in the head for posting a white square on his Instagram at the wrong time. Um, uh, the good lad who was going to make peace with this guy to say, hey, look and he shouldn't have had to do this but he said oh sorry i offended you and the guy agreed to meet him in limerick and say oh yeah we'll bury the beef you didn't mean it you're being conciliatory you you, you know you thought you're being funny but you offended me but now you apologize he said okay let's meet and shake hands and then he kicked the head off him on camera saying uh, uh saying talking about 400 years of slavery in ireland um you know so like that's the culture we live in where this guy can get away with this for this long doing videos going up to people forcing them to say this taboo word that could uh, legitimize violence apparently you know and it went on this long and it took the internet to kind of say what's going on here where were the school and um, where were the boomers where were the random normies acting up on this bringing it to the fore uh it took long enough but uh yeah that's but that's what you can look forward to in this kind of society of what what we've got modern ireland and um, for your kids is um is while they're talking about hate speech left right and center your kids could be on the butt end um physically sexually uh like in terms of sexual assault or any of this or just uh verbally and and polit whatever the word is being bullied um socially i think is the word i was looking for they could be uh, your kids could be on the end of the most egregious and nasty forms of racial abuse and it's just going to be overlooked you know, just like the guy in the nursing home raping all the old ladies. We'll just overlook that, just like Rotherham, overlook it. Uh, it's almost not that this guy was enough of a, a, a I don't want to be, I suppose, you know, enough of a bleep, enough of a bad person to do this. It's it's more about the fact that it's it's tolerated. And he feels like he's, because put it this way, if you, Phil Linnett, right? We love to quote Phil Linnett and Paul McGrath and all this, right? Those lads, they came around, they came of age in ireland of like the 70s and all that right and you know that i would never have crossed their minds it might have been because they were nice people good people or whatever but whether they were or not it would never have happened they wouldn't have thought of doing that not because they're intimidated or afraid but because they were they were in a ireland for the irish they were a minority within that but they had to fully integrate and the idea that you would just disrespect mams and insert your own racial power that you've been given by the state uh and and intimidation over people that would have been unthinkable to them so it's really not about the individual nasty guy it's about the the pool the 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 water that he swims in that ele that creates this sort of uh contempt sheer unbridled nasty racial contempt and bullying that's effectively permitted the the regime teachers schools everything else while they're talking about hate speech and lgbt and trans this and flowers and butterflies everywhere and all this while they're doing that the most egregious and horrible racial physical social um uh, abuse will be enacted on irish kids and they're going to be powerless they're going to be standing there like frozen on the spot because they can't do anything about it they, they they can't tell anyone about it because they know no one's really going to care and uh, because apparently racism only goes one way and all that stuff um 
it's it's a sign of things to come. Um, no, I'm glad that people online nipped it in the bud, or effectively, to, you know, turned it into a bit of a situation, um, or made it made it taboo, effectively. But if it wasn't for people online talking about it, this guy would still be up to his videos. They'd be getting worse and worse and worse, potentially. Um, think about it. If if he if that guy wasn't getting uh, scolded online and unpopular online. And he was just kept doing what he's doing. You know the teacher, you know the scaldy principal, you know the guards or anyone else is not going to say shit because they're all cowards, right? And and bought in. How far does it go? Where does it end? You know, we saw that in Limerick. We saw it in uh, Carrigaline. Um, nasty stuff. But uh, it is up to us online, um, or not just online, but Irish people who care about our country and don't want our people to be abused, racially abused. Uh, to I suppose uh, call these things out when we see it, but uh, and that's kind of what happened here. Anyway, I'm going to wrap it up. It's a quarter to one. I rambled away. Oh, super chats. Um, if anyone was so generous. Um, so what have I got? What have we got? So oh, Roddy Murray, thanks very much. Ten euro says, "I uh, hope it's not too big of a question. Uh, how do you think Ireland will look in ten years?" Um, my view, well, we don't know. It depends what way things are going to go, um, I suppose. But um, my view is that, like, barring, like, radical immigration, like, nationalist government, effectively, and then a lot of it hinges on what happens in America, how Europe falls apart. There's, like like you say, it's a big question. So I, I could go on all day talking about this. I'm sure you could as well. But external factors, internal factors, all these things are variable. We don't know. Will a nationalist government happen a real one, or will it just will we all end up in jail for political speech, legal speech, reasonable speech? Will we be persecuted or off the face of the earth, or will we win, etc.? Barring all of that, I feel like um, nationalism uh, broadly is is relevant no matter what, because in one sense you either you save Ireland for the Irish, you maintain an Irish demographic, you're successful politically somehow, and that's great. And we restore a sense of national pride, protections for Irish people, not just protections for everyone else, um, national, na national restoration. So that's great. Nationalism could lead to national restoration or it goes totally bad and we end up like they are in Ballyhonas as a sub 31% minority or less. Let's say worse, you know, it's, it's, well, you asked for 10 years, but let's say decades further than that. Irish people are a total minority, but as they become a minority, nationalism becomes totally inevitable for them. And we effectively end up being almost like a, like a diaspora people in our own country and all of that, which is terrible, like unimaginable. We avoid that at all costs. But if that happens, nationalism is essential. The nationalism is needed then more than ever in a way to fend for ourselves and to stand up for ourselves and to rely on each other and all of that kind of stuff and to increase the sense of identity and solidarity. That's just inevitable, would be inevitable in that scenario. It would be, the people would have to, like the most normal per person and all that would have to round and circle the wagons effectively. Um, so nationalism in that sense essential nationalism hopefully to win a national struggle and to achieve national restoration which is tale as old as time in this country but uh, either way nationalism is inevitable and essential so uh, 10 years I don't know I hope that in 10 years someone like me because I have my own stake in my own life I don't always want to be a pariah I don't go out of my way to be that way it's just how like if I was around 40, 50 years ago, I would be saying things that are so mundane as to be not worth my, worth wasting my breath. But now saying the same things. So it's not me that's a pariah or controversial. It's just the society that I happen to exist in, unfortunately. Um, so I hope that in 10 years, as events go and as, as the situation escalates and gets worse, I won't change my position, really. I'm, my position, I think, is solid. I think it's evergreen. But... Uh, the way the world will work is that I will no longer be a pariah. I would like that. Um, I would like to be given back, um, sort of like the cold being unpersoned. I would like to be repersoned. You know, that would be kind of good. And I think that's inevitable, not just for me, but for sort of everyone. Um, they can't do this sort of 
cancel thing for saying things that basically everybody believes that, that can't last really. So uh, I think um, a lot of like people who were thus far or hither, hitherto cast as marginal will have to be uncast as marginal and uh, just have to be accepted as like I am actually a legitimate voice in the society saying reasonable things and uh, blow through that sort of uh, that firewall effectively over time. Uh, so I don't know. Anyway, uh, thanks for the thanks for the super chat, Roddy. Uh, Finolo Mariku gives five euro and says, "Keep it up, thank you." Connor Rafferty, ten euro, thank you very much, and says, "If and when I get elected, I will need you as a policy advisor. Get ready for it." I've heard that a couple of times, so you're going to have to you're going to have to compete for that now. Put a, I say that like facetiously now. I, I, you know, I don't know what I'll be doing exactly uh, as time goes on, but. Anyway, uh, I hope you get elected. So Sheepdog gives five euro and says, thanks, Gerard. I'm not so sure what to say other than you're a great Cork and Irish lad. Thanks very much. You know, you can never lose your Cork, you know. Um, I'm a bit, Cork's gone a bit by the wayside, but uh, it's such a special thing. And I know it's a comedian's love to make the Cork joke, but uh, Cork is, uh, is the best place in the world, no matter what. And uh, it's not just a meme. It is the best place. And... Uh, for anyone who's from there that feeling when you come down the lower glanmire road if you've been away whether on holidays or away for a long time coming down the lower glanmire road into town seeing the port of cork and getting into the bridges and into town there's no more special feeling everyone from every county loves their home but nobody gets the special feeling that cork people do when we get into the city and when we get home so yeah um armchair limerick nationalist says cheers for the ramble road um and gives five euro thanks very much look i appreciate all those very much and uh i will leave it there so back soon have a lovely rest of your weekend and take care see you